And Beckham saw Sullivan off his line. Oh! This is a private member's bar. That is absolutely phenomenal. Exclusively for the supporters of the greatest football team in the world. Cleared. Geeks with a shot. Jerry Manchester United. Beckham. Into Sheringham. And so sorry. And welcome to the Biggie and Smalls podcast, your go-to source for all things Man United. Uh, today we're joined by Samuel Lockhurst from the Manchester Evening News. Uh, Samuel, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm very well, thank you. How, how both of you? Thank you for having me on as well. Yeah, yeah, we're excited to have you on. I know I wanted to uh, get into you about uh, the debacle from last Saturday. I mean, it seems like they're... It's a regular occurrence uh, with United. What were some of your takeaways from the Burnley match? I think a friend described it quite well, a uh, friend who sits by the tunnel at Old Trafford, when they said it's, it was like watching United versus United and that both teams were bad in similar yet yet different ways. And I think that, that there's that comparison between United and Burnley kind of highlights one of the one of the big problems that they have. Burnley created plenty of chances. United played, created plenty of chances as well. But you expect that from United against a team that were promoted uh, from the Championship only only last year. And Burnley, of course, are a, a different team to when they were first. Sorry, not when they were first in the Premier League, but when they were certainly an established Premier League team under Sean Dyche. But still, to have that change in approach and style, which they've they've navigated quite impressively under. Um, Vincent Company, but to then go to Old Trafford and have more of the ball to outpass United at Old Trafford and to have a near equal amount of, of good chances or clear cut chances, that's that is another legitimate concern for United to have as they look ahead um, to the changes that they need to make to the squad and, and possibly uh, the managerial change that they that, that they may have to make as well in the summer. And really, we're not I think those of us who watch United in in the press box on a on a regular basis. Uh, we're it's very very difficult to be surprised or, or shocked by by what we see, irrespective of who the opposition are. And I, I go back to when we're in the in the press room at Wembley just before the the semi final against Coventry, and um, colleague Rich Face said that there is no way. They'll win these next three games. Those three games being against Coventry, Sheffield United, and and Burnley, and that's a, a Championship team and the two worst teams in the Premier League. And in the end, they only won one of those games, excluding penalty shootouts. So uh, that's that's where United are really. And it, I suppose, given the season they've had, it's it's a little bit peculiar to to glance at the Premier League table at full time um, after games or certainly on Saturday when we had to look at the, the table after the draw and to see that they're still sixth and just about ahead of Newcastle. Yeah, uh, it's honestly, it's uh, I actually read in uh, one of your recent articles that, and even on uh, on your podcast how you were comparing the team basically to a mid-level club. I mean, which is kind of embarrassing when you think, of, you know, uh, a club like Man United. Uh, D, I know you had a question for Samuel. I think you uh, about the atmosphere and what's it like at Old Trafford. Yeah, Sam, how's it going? Um, yeah, you touched on it just just then that there might be a change in uh, changing guard at United with a new manager possibly coming in. And I wanted to pick your brain to see what's the atmosphere around Old Trafford at the minute. Like, you no, know, between from what you're seeing, is it similar to you no know, a Louis Van Gaal? No, he might. He finished the season, got the FA Cup final, won it against Crystal Palace, but then you had Mourinho go, caretaker manager, uh, Solskjaer came in, caretaker manager. So it's like we're back into the Louis Van Gaal era, if you will, where a manager came in, had a high reputation, had his philosophy that he was really like stubborn to implement, and it just seems to be falling flat. So is this is this rinse and repeat from the Van Gaal season, or is this going to be? Let's get a structure in for him. Let's get Ashworth in. We've got you no know, Wilcox already on there. So, like, what what what's your opinion on it? Because you definitely are, you know you're the boots on the ground over there. You see the ins and outs of everything that's going on. I mean, the the comparison with Van Gaal is is completely valid, and I've thought it for four or five months that there have been some very eerie parallels between him and 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 Ten Hag, and it, it's you know, it's, it happens to be a coincidence, I suppose, that they're both from from the same country but the way the season is the, the sheer regression 
is is quite stark. Van Gaal had a very good first season. Ten Hag had an even better first season, and I just don't think anybody uh, really saw this coming. I don't think anybody expected United's form to f- fall off a cliff the way it has done. For them to have lost as many games as they have, they've barely gone a month without some kind of form of crisis or, or setback or that being in the news for, for some negative um, reason or, or, or whatever it may be. And I think United fans are quite, the match goes is, are quite principled in that they're, they're very, very reluctant to outright turn on the manager. Now, they they did with Van Gaal. Um, I, I, I still vividly recall, I, I didn't go to the game uh, in press, but I was there... I think I had a hospitality. I was invited by Adidas to go to it when they lost to Southampton in January 2016, and I re- and I remember vividly that he was specifically booed when he approached uh, the tunnel. There, there might have been boos at full time because they lost one nil and then they subsided, and then there were definitely boos for him. And that was the fans, um, their, their their patient snapping. And a minority did snap with Moyes with the the wrong one chosen out banner. Uh, sorry, wrong one, Moyes out uh, banner. And of course, they, you had that dreadful chosen one banner that someone thought it was a great idea to put up, which even he didn't like. And of course, Solskjaer on, on his last stand at Watford, when he went over to the away end, he was he was booed as well. Uh, so United fans have got it in them to, you know, to to cross that line. There, there is a, a straw that can break the camel's back, but they haven't, I wouldn't say they've, I've heard them outright boo Ten Hag. There was booing at the weekend. There was definitely booing for his decision to take Mainu off, as there was when he took off Hoyland against Brighton and City, I think it was, earlier in the season. Those three games are home games as well. And sometimes you look at the away follow and you think that's the the hardcore contingent, the most reliable gauge of, of fan sentiment. But sometimes it is more significant if it's the home support that are expressing disapproval for a decision and and on Saturday tens of thousands did that I think because there's an FA Cup final to come and it's a, it's another huge FA Cup final and it's the possibility of of beating city of, of trying to deny city a, a, a double even should they should they win the Premier League title I don't think they want a, a, a they don't want too toxic an atmosphere. And, and certainly with Van Gaal, it did get to the point where it was pretty obvious that he was going to see out the season. I think after they recovered against Michelin's when Rashford came in, made his debut a few days later, he had an even better game against Arsenal, scoring twice on his league debut. I think that, from that moment on, it was pretty clear that Van Gaal was going to see out the season. But it also felt clear to me at the time, trying to recall the, the work I was doing, that Mourinho was going to come in at the end of the season. With, with Ten Hag, maybe three or four weeks ago, you'd have said his position was in the balance. I think it's teetering more towards him him going now just because the season has, in a strange way, it's spiralled. It's, it's very rare that a manager reaches an FA Cup final and, and after getting through that semi-final, his reputation is damaged. I think it may, it may have happened with Wenger in 2014 when Arsenal were one nil down against Wigan who were in the championship at the time and they had to get um, past them via via penalties and you know the whole Wenger out move, movement was gaining membership on a weekly basis and they got battered a few times in the league uh, by the by the big hitters I think Chelsea thrashed them 6-0 Liverpool 5-0 or 5-1 they conceded 6 at City and where United haven't had a truly apocalyptic result this season they, they did last season a couple of times of course against Brentford and Liverpool I think their heaviest defeat this season has, has been 3-0 which sounds pretty modest I mean there have been some really bad 3-0s um, among the defeats but I think that's also probably ensured that Ten Hag has, has been able to, to see out this season and also for a, a large part of the season as well there was there was clearly a power vacuum there where the strategic review took an absolute eternity to be uh, to be completed and then after the Christmas Eve announcement about Sir Jim Ratcliffe's minority stake it was another couple of months until it was until it was ratified so although 
you know, the, the, the form has been pretty dreadful all season. There haven't really been too many windows where you'd have, I don't think any of us wrote, yes, he has to be absolutely sacked now um, because of all the, you know, all, all the minutiae surrounding the club. But now they've got, you know, they've got decision makers in there. And although it will be a while until Ashworth starts, you know, Omar Barada, the, the incoming chief executive, from what I'm told, he's, He's pretty much working already, even though he's still on gardening leave at City. Uh, Jason Wilcox has, of course, come in now as well. But I think Barada will be the one who holds you know, quite a lot of sway when it comes to making that definitive decision on the manager. OK, um, oh, that's uh, that's great info. I, um, uh, you know, one of the things that I know caught our uh, attention is obviously uh, Ten Hag's uh, recent uh, comments in his press conference, the dynamic team. Obviously, you're in these press conferences like, uh, <laughs> what's your reaction to that? <laughs> I, I think he said that to the, the BBC reporter in the, in the tunnel at the weekend. So it would have been... Like, Obviously, the, the game finishes, the, the managers go back to their tunnels and then they have to speak to the, the rights holders, the broadcasters who who are at the game. And he, he came out with that, that statement. And sometimes we see it because I think the BBC's live blog is pretty quick in terms of quoting managers' post-match comments to, to the BBC or to Sky Sports, whoever it may be who's at the game in, um, in broadcasting format. But I was I was actually in the mix zone on on Sunday, sorry not Sunday Saturday, uh, speaking to to Anthony. So I di I didn't see the clip until probably later in the evening. But I, I've I've noticed for a while now that that Ten Hag he he sounds very different to in, in press conferences to last season. Last season he was he would often come out after United won a game and he'd be quite critical um, in in a constructive way. And we all thought this is this is what they need. It's someone who's striving to raise the standards who his his maxim last season was good is not good enough and this season he's hardly ever said that and that's because since Ratcliffe was the only bidder left at the table he's he's effectively he's been on trial in that he's got to prove himself to a new decision maker and when you're in such an invidious position you're bound to say things that you wouldn't normally say and that's happened quite a lot with him he in the first half of the season, he wasn't citing injuries as an excuse. This calendar year, he has cited them as, as an excuse on a number of occasions. He's started to complain about some very tenuous refereeing calls or officiating calls as well, which I don't think many people have got a lot of time for. It's not as if United have had a howler against them this season like Liverpool did with the Luis Diaz decision against Tottenham or Burnley when Luton had that late goal um, that they scored against them, the equaliser, when it looked like, well, I thought James Trafford was was definitely fouled. And I think most people did. I'm sure there have been a few other really bad ones as well. But I don't think United have really had a truly e egregious decision go against them. And when you're complaining about injuries, you're complaining about refereeing decisions and you're calling a team... I mean, at the weekend, I think he referred to the young players in the team or very young players in the team. And you look at starting lineup at the weekend, Anana's twenty eight, Dallow's twenty five, Wambisaka twenty six, Maguire's thirty one, Casemiro thirty two, Fernandez is twenty nine, um Christian Eriksen is thirty two. There, there are three quite young players in that team, Mainu, Garnacho and Hoyland, and clearly he is staking a lot in those players and that's why he drew that comparison with the the Ferguson team of O four, O five, because you had Ronaldo, who was um, 19, going on 20. You had Rooney, who was a 19-year-old, pretty much as well. And th those players were going to spearhead the next great United side, and they absolutely did that. And I think Ten Hag is trying to draw that parallel to, again, to try and make his case that give me time. But it's not a young team, and he's he's given the illusion that it is a young team. There's, there's so much experience in that United side. I think if... Um, you know, 20, 25 is a young age, of course, but say a colleague mm -hmm. wrote uh, Manchester United youngster Diogo Dallo, if you're a sub-editor, you're taking the word youngster out of that because he's been at the club for six years. And I think the word youngster in football, it, it has a very different meaning. I remember Ronald Koeman about six or seven years ago 
Ross Barkley was 23 at the time and he said he's not a young player. And I completely agreed with him because Barkley came into the Everton team in 2011. This was 2017, so it was six years into his Everton career. You're not really young, a young player at that point. Ryan Giggs was playing um, for the United veterans in their training games when he was about 25 or 26 because, of course, he made his debut at such a young age and he banked an awful lot of experience by the time he, he, he turned 25. So th this is what I mean in terms of, you know, we're, we're going to press conferences and Ten Hag is saying things to us that we're hearing a lot from him anyway. He is repeating himself quite a lot, but he has run out of things to say and it's it's, it's become difficult for him to make an original case uh, that's, that's going to be compelling enough for people, for, for the power brokers at the club to say, yes, he absolutely should stay. And he's also making some factual errors as well. Um, I mean, a number of times he's referred to the, the City home game last season as the only time that he's been able to play his strongest side. And that's that's just not true. Dallow, who was absolutely the first choice right back at that time, he was injured for that game. You look at the team, Malassia was starting at left back. Lisandro Martinez was on the bench. The one time he has been able to play his strongest side was at Wolves in February of this year. And United, I thought, played their, their best half of football all season. So that actually, if he was correct about that, that's quite a strong case for him to say, look, when everyone is fit, this is what we can do. And in fairness to him that night as well, after the game, he was he was a little bit unhappy because they dominated Wolves, but they'd gone from 3-1 up in the 80-something minute to 3-3, and then they needed that dramatic Kobe Mainu winner in the 97th minute to to win the game when they should have won it far more comfortably. But that's that's the one game this season where I've watched United and I've heard Ten Hag afterwards and I thought this is clearly the the Man United that he wants to present. But unfortunately, it's it's only happened pretty much once this season. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I know as we've talked, it's a team of Jekyll and Hyde. You get. One team, one half, and a completely different team the second half. Um, you met, you mentioned um, – uh, I did see your recent article, a conversation with Anthony. Um, what's his mindset like? Obviously, he's been the brunt of a lot of United fans, I've, you know, rightfully or rightfully not so. What was your takeaway from that conversation? Well, it was um, it's a different kind of conversation with a with a player. In that there was a translator present. Uh, he he didn't speak in in English at all, and that that's not a surprise. I mean, especially with um, with with some of the South American players, it's it, it takes a while until they they conduct an interview in English. I think Garnacho's only just started doing it this season, having joined United in 2020 a, a, a very young age as well i might add but uh it's so it's it's, it's difficult to get a rhythm there you're you, although you're it's a q a with the player you're talking to a translator to the who then you know kind of sends on the message and uh the, the, the player responds but i think looking at the translation of it he's a his his character and I, I did write about this a little bit last season. It's it's not really been so much the case this season, but there are there are some impressive character traits about him in that he's got a, a spiky side to him, in that he has got you know quite uh, laudable self belief. The, the, the fact that he said that you know he uses criticism if effectively as, as as a positive that he he's not too fussed about it and that that's certainly been my experience in, in covering United that the foreign players the overseas players they they aren't too fussed about criticism because they're not reading they're not reading uh, newspapers or news websites in in English it's it's not their mother tongue they probably care more about what um, the media back home is saying about them I remember being told that Paul Pogba for example wasn't fussed about what English newspapers would write about him, but if he got a negative, if there was a negative piece about him in Le Keep, then he did have a problem with it because <laughs> that was in his homeland and, and he valued uh, the, the, the commentary and the coverage more in, in his homeland. But from my experience, in terms of United players who've had a, an issue or taken umbrage with something that I've written or or said, they've 
either been British players or or an academy player. There was there was one academy player who is is not British, and um, I, I found it quite borderline sad, really, and just how how obsessive his team and I and I thought that was a red flag immediately that he had a team that were monitoring coverage regarding his performances, and it it did get to the point where it, it got him it, it got him quite down. I spoke to a couple of people close to him. And they they provided some context around his performances, and sometimes that's all it takes. If you have a candid conversation and people thrash it out, and you give your side of the story, they give their side of the story, and you can you can end up agreeing on the subject, or you can disagree agreeably. And with with Anthony, of course, he's as you said, he's he's had an awful lot of stick, and and. He's he's deserved a lot of it since he he came to United. His his form this season has been particularly poor, and I've, I've asked Ten Hag about it a couple of times, and Ten Hag has been um, quite fair in his assessment. Of course, the, the the allegations in England and Brazil that that has had undeniably an impact on his on his form, and I think those those investigations are, are still ongoing. And I think if you are in that position and, and you you're that scrutinised, then your form is is probably bound to waver. Um, unfortunately for him, I thought he was excellent at Chelsea three or four weeks ago, and that could have been a turning point. But then he wasn't he wasn't robust enough to start a few days later against Liverpool. And then the following week, he was injured for the Bournemouth game. So he's I I, I don't think he's going to be hitting a turning point this season. Given that that tomorrow's May, uh, he, he might be able to salvage his season with. A big goal in the running, or if if he scores the winner in the FA Cup final, but so far it's. I, I, I thought his first season was reasonably decent, and he was certainly a miss in the in the FA Cup final last year. But but this season it's it's been there's there's not been a lot to write home about as far as Anthony's concerned. No, definitely not. Um, um, uh, one other thing that I saw that caught my attention, which is uh, similar to a lot of the uh, American sports, is the salary cap. Uh, over there, it's not something you really see at all. What's your perspective on that? Um, obviously, you know, I see both sides of it. I see how, uh, you know, the bigger clubs, it could hamper them competing in Europe. and But I also, I, I think I might also like it just for parity in the league. What's your kind of take on that? Yeah, it's. I mean, th- this this has been. I think the the talk of a salary cap has been floating around for for, for quite a while, and you know the, the money in football has has got out of control as well. You had that watershed summer in in twenty seventeen when PSG spent what was it one hundred ninety eight million on on Neymar and one hundred sixty million mm-hmm. on Mbappe and. I mean, United were involved in a little bit as well that summer. I think they agreed an overall fee of ninety million for Lukaku, but that they had. I remember speaking to to Ed Woodward shortly before that summer transfer window, and he he predicted that it would be a crazy market, and and he was absolutely right. Uh, the Carl Walker fee, uh, the Benjamin Mendy fee, because City of course broke records for for fullbacks um, in, in terms of transfer fees. I think Edison was a, a, a world record fee for a goalkeeper at that point as well in in pound sterling. But fortunately, it has, it has calmed down. Um, I mean, the, I think in, in terms of our industry and, and transfers, it's, it's almost like, I guess, someone who, works in, in a, someone who works in a Hershey's factory going off chocolate because the more we do transfer stories, the less... Enthusiastic we are about them because everyone just wants every cough and spit as to what's what's going on regarding the minutiae and it's you know th- those windows are open what four months out of twelve a year and obviously the the interest seems to just you, you think it's gone through the roof already but then it'll go through another 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 roof um, and and we we're, we're duty bound to to report on it of course but. I, I, you know, with the salary cap thing, it's 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 certainly not my my wheelhouse. I mean, the, you know, the, the football finance experts out there who um, who are well on top of those things. But I, I'd I'd like to think it's it's a good thing, and if if spending is reined in, then so be it. I mean, it was interesting in the COVID year. Um, 
in, in 2020, City spent quite a bit of money when obviously spending was reined in largely across the board and, and Barada, who was the chief football operating officer at City at the time, he did give an interview to my, my colleague Sai Bykovsky at the MEN, um, which is, is probably worth... I reread it again after after it was a after the United announcement in January, and he gave quite an interesting breakdown in terms of the the, the more complexities and um, the the reality of of having to spend as as an elite football club. Um, but I, you know, looking at the January transfer window, hardly anyone spent anything, and that's because clubs are clubs have been spooked by the Everton and Forest points deductions. There's a there's a young player at Rochdale who are a northern, um, sorry, they're a national league club in the the mm-hmm. fifth tier in England. A young player called George Nevitt, who looked certain to be sold in, in January. A very good young player. I think he's a youth international for Wales. Crystal Palace like the look of him. But after the announcements of Everton and Nottingham Forest and the, the points deductions that they faced, Palace was spooked by it and decided they weren't spending any money on, on, on any other players. They made a very good signing, in fact. The irony is that they actually signed, um, I think it's Adam Wharton from from Blackburn in January, who, who looks yeah. a really, really good player for about £20 million. But even over, a, in, in the case of George Nevitt, what would have been a, a six-figure fee, I think, so relatively economical, they decided, no, we mm-hmm. need to wait until the summer. So... Um, I think if if it can somehow create a more competitive environment, then great. But you know, th- these, I think, clubs always tend to find loopholes or ways of getting around um, restrictions that some attempt to impose on them. City, of course, did it with the the FFP uh, with with UEFA mm-hmm. four years ago because that was time barred. Goodness knows when the Premier League will get around to properly addressing yeah. the 115 charges, but uh, I think it's it's going. Yeah, the, the money in football it's 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 always topical, but it's it, it it also does seem to be changing quite a lot as well. Absolutely. Um, well, uh, Dee, did you have anything else for Samuel before we signed off? No, I was just I was actually just going to touch on the. Uh... You know, some of the points he made about with Ten Hag in comparison from last season to this season in, in terms of the criticism of the team. And it's definitely, you can, as a fan, you can definitely see it. Uh, last year, he was more critical of um, you know, certain ways of the play. But this year, it's almost like he's taken a step back because of, unfortunately, you, as fans, we can see it. The player power is a big part of Man United, unfortunately. It's got, you know, you hear all the time, like you hear the rumors that Solskjaer said to some of his coaching staff, like Kieran McKenna and Michael Carrick, that, these players are going to get me sacked. And you no, know, Mourinho and Pogba had a, had a fallout. We all know what happened to Mourinho. So it seems that I think at first he wanted to come in with that authoritarian mindset. And it, it's not, it wasn't working for him. So he thought, okay, let me take a step back. And with now, with, I, I, you rightly said, with uh, he's you know, blaming injuries, there's a lot of teams have injuries. Um, and But I think one of the things he might be trying to do, and I don't think he's, he's an expert at because I remember – Growing up watching Ferguson, he was amazing at it. Like he, a player could have an absolute nightmare of a match, but instead of talking about the player having a nightmare of a match, he would turn his attention to like the referee or the pitch conditions or even the way he would blame anything, just to keep the just to keep the pressure off of the players. And I think Tanak's trying to do that, but unfortunately, we can everyone's we've sort of been through the windmill already with of all the the ins and outs of the last decade or so. Um, so I do believe, and I think it's coming to a point where uh, I know that he's decided to not take you know, certain questions from certain journalists now as a result of it. And I don't know if that's to protect himself or to protect the players, but um, you've got Garnacho come out with his, you know, the social media, which Keith and I, we talked about it in the previous podcast, but some of these players, we don't even know if even they even manage their own social media. It could be their cousins, it could be their brothers. You just never know. Um, I know he dealt with it internally, but the Jaden Sancho uh, cloud is still over him. Um, and I know that was discussed. And then just... Honestly, lastly, I know there's a lot of fans when we talk about if Ten Hag was to go this summer. Um, and it's a, it's a big transition summer. Um, I don't think people realized how much Ferguson was. Everyone knew who much Ferguson was, but I don't think a lot of people realized how much David Gill really was a huge part of the success in terms of you know, transfer strategies and making sure the right philosophy of players came in, 
and so forth. So this year, um, you hear a lot of names getting thrown out. I've seen Peter Schmeichel came out and said Thomas Tuchel has won. Um, I know Alan Shearer came out after the FA Cup semi-final against Coventry and said the man, no, Ratcliffe's made his mind up. The, the man, no, Ten Hag's already gone. He's just going to probably say, no, there's no point in bringing a, a manager in for three or four weeks and then try to get, no, and then all of a sudden change them all over again. Um, so from with that mindset of trying to do the whole swap and change, who are you hearing? Are you hearing anybody at all that's like a, a solid, no, a, a solid candidate? Because I know you hear Zidane has come out, like you hear all these reports that Zidane's going for Bayern Munich, but then you hear him, well, he's also watching a close eye on United to see if that's an opportunity. Because Keith and I have talked about it before. Um, Zidane will walk into any changing room and just have that aura that players just, I think, just he did it at Real Madrid. Real Madrid were a bit of a shambles. He came in, the players respected him just off his playing career alone. And he won numerous Champions Leagues there. He won the you know, La Liga there. So you've got Zidane, Tuchel, um, and that's honestly, I think Graham Potter's and all the ones getting thrown around. But I think I think you would proceed with caution with him after what happened at Chelsea. I think the job at United might be too big for him. Um, but you're hearing any rumblings. I know he might, I think it's going to be, a t I personally, I think it's going to be a Louis van Gaal season. I think he's going to get the FA Cup final. Regardless of the result, I do believe that Ten Hag, unfortunately, is going to probably uh, be told to walk, and they're going to probably bring someone else on. I think, like you rightly said, I think Ashworth, Wilcox, and Ratcliffe have been talking behind the scenes. I think they're trying to get that a formulation of a, some sort of um, structure that United need to go forward. But from what you're hearing, are you, like, what, what are you seeing, like, no – and hearing amongst your different amongst your colleagues, because I know that uh, there's so many names getting thrown. United's a, a global team, so there's going to be names thrown from every which direction. There will be a lot of managers who would absolutely encourage um, speculation or, or links re with their name to to the club. With with Zidane, a colleague summed up, I thought quite well his. his position at Real Madrid in that they said it was almost like he, he was the babysitter because they had Benitez in who was always going to be an unpopular appointment Zidane w was had been that player had been a player quite recently and was current enough in those players minds that he immediately commanded respect even though he hadn't really been a coach I know he, he coached the, the B team but he hadn't coached at um, proper first team level and he also inherited an absolutely incredible bunch of players where you had the best of the best in almost every position. And fair dues to, to have won the European Cup three seasons on the trot. He had to keep them motivated. But it also did feel like he could just leave them to their own devices because they had Casemiro, Modric, um, Cruz. They had the great goal scorer in the game's history up top. They had Benzema, they had Ramos, Varane, uh, you know, Kellen Navas was a very good goalkeeper Gareth. for them during this period. Gareth Bale doing what he did yeah, in the Bale final well. in, in, in Kiev as well. I think if, if Zidane was that serious, you know, serious an option for United, they wouldn't have gone with Ralph Rangnick as an interim uh, in 2021. And I know yeah. the, deci the decision makers have changed, but I remember writing at the time and it was before... It was before the beginning of the end under Sarsgaard really started, but some some fans were starting to get impatient and Conte was available, Zidane was available. I wrote a piece essentially saying why there's no way United will go near these two, and they didn't. I mean, Conte was, was well up for it, but United didn't fancy him, and I fully understand why they didn't go in that direction. With with Tuchel, I think he is a, he is a bit of a kindred spirit with Conte in that he is... He is truculent. He is confrontational. Uh, he does bicker occasionally with uh, personnel in the media. I've, I've seen this season um, him, you know, giving some pundits short shrift after a game where, where Bayern Munich won. But I thought it was quite telling when I, I've, I've been in a couple of his press conferences this season by virtue of United playing Bayern. But he was very, very respectful towards United when they played when Bayern beat them in December and this was at the pre-match press conference and he even mentioned Fergie time he mentioned the final in 99 and at that point I thought this is this is someone who 
is is reading the room and can see the wood for the trees and probably senses he won't be at Bayern Munich next season. And then, of course, it was announced that he won't be at Bayern Munich next season. And there's it, is the, what league is he is his coaching style suited to outside Germany? It's England. What English club would would he logically go to? It would be United. So he has to be. I think he has to be considered. Would he be? Would he be long term? I have my doubts, but very few managers would be long term in in this day and age. Um, Gallingly for United, two of the best examples of that are just down the road at City and down the other side of the road at, at Liverpool with with Klopp and Guardiola, who who are coaches that I'm still convinced that if they really wanted them, if they had a proper structure or proper direction in place, and they weren't quite as antiquated in their thinking that they could have got one of them or, or both of them at whichever time it suited them. But look, any any else have, have certainly assessed potential replacements. I, I suspect that if they do decide to change manager, the appointment, it, it won't be universe. It, there won't be universal approval um, for, for that manager from United supporters just by, just because there is not, a real clear and obvious candidate to come in and replace Ten Hag. That's another reason why he's he's been allowed to see out the season. I did a piece, I think last month or however many weeks ago it was, that in terms of Manchester United managerial changes, even going back as far as when Smart Busby first retired in 1969, they always had their ducks lined up or there was always an obvious candidate. And... Even in the event of, I think, when they sacked Dave Sexton in 1981, they looked at, um, who was it? I think it was Laurie McMenemy, Ron Saunders, Bobby Robson, couldn't get any of them, so they went for their fourth choice in Ron Atkinson. And I think when you look at the recent developments at Liverpool and Bayern Munich, both both those clubs have clearly not been able to get their first choice um, coaches for next season because Xabi Alonso has decided to stay at Bayer Leverkusen. But... They're, they're continuing with the process. They will get a coach in. They'll back themselves to um, to do well next season. It's not panic stations. They've done their due diligence. They clearly had a short list of options in mind. And up until a point, I suppose, I think there was an argument from a lot of United fans that they shouldn't sack Ten Hag because there wasn't a better replacement out there. But I think the way the form... The way their form has deteriorated since the season resumed after the March internationals, that that excuse just or that argument it do, it just doesn't stack up anymore. United have won two of their last nine league games. They, you know that 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 says it all in itself. And um, um, unfortunately for them, their their league season has been a bit of a write off for a few weeks. But at least the supporters do have an FA Cup final to look forward to. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, no, I agree uh, with that. Yeah. yeah the, the Tuchel, the Tuchel thing reminded me a lot of. I don't know if you remember when you, when um, Real Madrid knocked Man United out with the nanny sending off Ronaldo scoring, and uh, after the match, Mourinho w- was so like almost enamored by United, saying the better team lost, the best team yeah. lost. And you could tell that was almost like that was almost his interview or, or so-called like uh that was his that's him trying his best to put his name because i think him and ferguson had a great relationship off the pitch and i do believe he could i think he he may have gotten a little bit of insight that ferguson was leaving that was his last season i think that was his best way of trying to put his best name forward but obviously it didn't know of Moyes was already a candidate there but it was uh it was definitely I, I was first as soon as i heard two children doing the same thing it was very very eerily similar between the two of them it was almost they were both enamored with the situation. They were trying to just put their hat, their name in the hat. But we'll see what happens. Like I would love to, to, to have Ten Hag to get the structure around him. Like you rightly said, there was, um, there's been a change uh, with Murtal gone and uh, obviously Ed Woodward leaving and so forth. So there's been a constant change of guard. But we'll see what happens. It's going to be a very interesting summer again for United and United fans. <laughs> it certainly will. Absolutely. Uh, uh, um. All right. Well, that's a good place to wrap up, guys. Uh, Samuel, I really appreciate you hopping on with us today. Uh, this has been fantastic, man. I really appreciate your time. No, thank you ever so much for having me on, and, and nice to speak to both of you, and nice to virtually meet both of you as well.